CPR could be used in a variety of settings. And you're right, most people think CPR drownings. But it could be something as simple as you're at a store and someone just collapses. Because you don't know when it's going to happen. Most of the time when people go into cardiac arrest, when their heart stops, 80% of the time, it does happen outside the hospital setting, which is why it's so important that we have more people that are trained in CPR because you don't know when it's going to happen. This is episode 148 with Carrie Zakaris of Desert Education Solutions. Enjoy! Welcome to your go-to podcast for the pool and spa industry. My name is Tyler Rasmussen. And my name is Greg Diafania. And this is the Pool Chasers Podcast. All right. Well, thank you for coming down to the studio to be with us here today. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we're going to discuss a lot of things CPR here in a minute. But first, can you share with us a little bit about yourself and kind of what your background is? Uh, Sure. So first of all, my name is Carrie. And I am a nurse by day and superhero by night, uh, where I teach CPR. But uh, first and foremost, I am an RN here in Arizona. Um, I'm originally from the Midwest, and I started my nursing career back in the 90s before either one of you were born. We were born. So, were whoa, you? Whoa, okay, whoa, okay, whoa, okay. Whoa, <laughs> We're born in the oh, my 80s, baby. Yeah, okay, 80s, all right. Babies. Okay, well, I, was, I could have been your babysitter. I was born in the 70s then. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I'm training a lot of new people these days, and they're like, you're the same age as my mom. And I'm like, oh, no, go over there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's awesome. I make references to stuff. It's lost on them. Because you're old so. as F. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. So <laughs> I feel these days. <laughs> Yeah, so I was trained back in the in the nineties when my hair was much bigger. Um, and then I came out here in two thousand eight, and I've been working as a nurse. And then my husband and I started our little CPR company in two thousand twelve. Nice. You said you're from Chicago, right? Mm-hmm, the Chicagoland area. A lot of people from Illinois say Chicago. I'm actually from Evergreen Park, the Windy City. Do you know why they call it the Windy City? <laughs> I want to say the wind, but I think it has something to do with politics. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you got it. They, uh, I think what I what I've heard is it, it's actually the politicians. I said a long time ago is because they were full of hot wind, and oh, they moved after that. But <laughs> pretty sure that. But I've heard that there's a good gust that comes off the uh, lake as well. It's a it's a breeze. A breeze. <laughs> it's a breeze. <laughs> the lake effect. So you took your first. You said travel thing in California before mm-hmm. you, and then where'd you go? Um, actually I came to Arizona. I took my first travel assignment. I worked all through Illinois and Indiana, and then I kind of needed a break from that environment. And I decided to dip my toes into travel nursing and I went to California and I loved the assignment. I had a great time there. And then I got offered a position here and I never left. When you went to California, you thought you were going to be by the beach, didn't you? I did. I thought I was going to be in Fresno Beach. (laughs) And I was in Fresno. Sad, sad day when you were in Fresno. <laughs> Are you being that. funny or is there actually a Fresno beach? <laughs> there really is a Fresno beach. Apparently it's called, it's called, there's it's a called city. Fresno beach. But like not that Fresno, there's not like a city called Fresno beach, but there's a beach named Fresno down by the LA area. And you thought that was where you were going. Somebody sent That's you a so map, huh? Where yeah. Fresno looked like it was <laughs> trick you. Well, oh, I, yeah, I, I didn't check close. the map. I <laughs> I just remember Polly Shore was being down on Fresno. Oh, Polly Shore, Fresno. Fresno. <laughs> so I let my inner Polly Shore take me to Fresno, California, and then I get oh. off like at an airport, and they don't even have those little runway things. You literally get off the stairs onto the tarmac, and I'm like, "Where's my little runway thing?" And they're like, "No, you got to walk across the tarmac." Yep. So Fresno Airport is not very big. There's literally the guy who takes your ticket, puts the <laughs> luggage, and I'm like, if you start flying this plane, I am walking home. There is no <laughs> way. I mean, you're in these little like puddle jumpers. It's ridiculous, but that's <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I almost came, stayed there. You almost stayed there. I almost did stay in Fresno, but I I really loved Arizona. So mm. that's good. We we love it too. We're still here, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When you come out of a Midwest winter and you come out here and you're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Yeah. So. Well, you can hide from the the heat. You know, you can get a job indoors or be in your truck. You get snowed in. There's not much you can do about that. No. Unless you got one of those like Elon Musk uh, fire torches that he likes to play with <laughs> to like just torch all the snow. But 
Those are a little hard to come by, so. Yeah, there was a shortage of those, actually, I heard, <laughs> for the winter season. So the ice cream man out there just yeah. sell those? Yeah. I, get, I got one at the Menards. I got Menards. one at Menards. Yeah, we oh, don't have yeah. Menards out here. So. No, we don't. Oh, can I mention name brands? I'm sorry. You can say Menards. Yeah. Okay. You can't you say You save that. more money there. You, you save big money, yeah. actually. Big I money. I'm sorry. That's I heard right. that. <laughs> Menards, yeah, that's their it's that's their slogan. It's like the Home Depot it's of Home the Depot. Midwest, but oh, okay. they also sell food items, craft items, and sometimes clothing. Yes, it's like it's Target, like Walmart, oh. it's kind of, but not like a full food aisle. Just like a, a tractor Walmart. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> beef jerky, a lot of beef jerky. There's like a whole section of beef jerky, literally. But that's like a slogan. room this big full of beef jerky. Save big, <laughs> save big money at Menards. You that's do. Their, that's their slogan. I dig it. <laughs> I do. Right to the point. Yep. <laughs> All right. Let's jump into some real conversation here. So what are you talking about? This is real. <laughs> what the hell? Before we get into that, you being from Chicago, I got to know, if you're in Chicago, what's better, uh, pizza or hot dogs? Mm. Oh, gosh. Good question. You know, okay. So I know like we're up here in Scottsdale and we opened up Blue Mon and yeah, whatever. I can't even say it. And I'm from there because real Chicagoans aren't like, let's go to Blue Mon and yeah. That's where you take your family that comes into town. Like, oh, let's go get a deep dish. We don't, I eat like the square pie that's cut in squares. I don't like my stuff cut in triangles. You know, like that's Chicago pizza. Like greasy layer of cheese with a little cornmeal on the bottom. Oh. That that's amazing. real Chicago. Oh my God, there's a great place down in Tucson. We can go right now. What's it called? It's called Little Rocco's mm. of Chicago. Down right. on Broadway. We're, we are cutting the podcast short today. <laughs> yes. Due to pizza pick up, pick up a live feed. A at pizza the... rut. <laughs> By the way, they make their own ranch dressing too. Mm, oh, yeah. God. Like I could drink it. It is so good. I'd have it like a ranch smoothie and a slice of pizza. There you go. Um, so pizza's good. Hot dogs, you know, I'm, I personally am not a big hot dog fan, but because you can't put ketchup on a Chicago hot dog, and that's the only way I can eat them. So that like, that's all I was gonna say. The time that the pizza won from that conversation, yeah. Yeah. You're going with pizza for sure. <laughs> it's a hot dog. I mean, what can you do with a hot dog? Just put it on a bun, throw some chili on it, whatever. Yeah, but I can't do a Chicago pizza. dog either. That's a weird, weird hot dog. You have to have ketchup on a hot dog, I but know. I can't say that or I lose my Chicago cred. <laughs> cut that out, Kyle. Yeah, cut that yeah. out. They won't let me back in. <laughs> I'll get stopped at the O'Hare Airport. You'll stop right there, okay? <laughs> we heard you on the Pole Chasers podcast talking yeah. about our hot dogs. Can't be you putting can't no ketchup on that here. hot dog. You're a disgrace. <laughs> <laughs> Kick me out of the city. Dub bears, <laughs> and you're gone. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned your your CPR training business and stuff. So there's a lot of different side hustles that healthcare people do. But out of all things, how come you decided to choose education and, and CPR? Um, well, a couple of reasons. First of all, I do like education. I, I love teaching. Actually, when it came down to becoming a nurse or, you know, I'm from Chicago, so they give you like two choices. You become a teacher or you become a nurse and you marry a firefighter or a cop. Those are kind of the rules. It's outside. I don't make the rules. So <laughs> I really wanted to be a teacher, but then I learned how to give shots, and that's even 10 times better, like all that fun medical stuff. So I went into the nursing track, but nursing gives you that opportunity to become a teacher too. So <laughs> I get to teach and still be a nurse. Um, but to go into CPR particularly, because there's a lot of different ways to earn a little extra cash as a nurse. A lot of people go into you know personal training or sell real estate or whatever. Um, but I decided to teach CPR mainly because there's not a lot of places out here that teach CPR and have a physical location like we do. There's a couple, but there wasn't a lot. And most people think that CPR training is just for healthcare people, and it's not. It's available to just about anyone. And I also suffered a personal loss in my own life, and I attribute some of that loss was to the lack of him receiving CPR at the time. So, which I can tell you a little more about that. Yeah, sorry yeah. to hear that. Can you uh, share with us what happened exactly? Yes. So my first husband, it was 2004, and he was on a work job, and they were putting in, okay, this is 2004, so they were putting in coaxial cable to have internet-enabled cash registers. So he was working for a large company putting in these coaxial cables and while he was putting them in 
There was some old electricity left in the ceilings because these are some old buildings. He was in Chicago when it happened. These are old buildings, so they don't always have accurate blueprints and floor plans. And they were working in an area there shouldn't have been electrical wires, but there were. And he was electrocuted. Unfortunately, when at the time he was electrocuted, he was on a ladder. So he fell. When he fell, the crew that was with him called 911. And due to the nature of it, I was able to hear the 911 calls. And it was horrifying because they didn't know what to do. And the 911 operators, they do a great job. They're able to talk you through just about anything. But they're also operating completely blind. They can't see what's happening. So they have to rely on the bystander to tell them what was happening. And they kept asking, well, is he breathing? And they kept saying, yes, he was. Because when people do go into cardiac arrest, they make these agonal type breaths that kind of look like real breathing. So it's hard to distinguish for the lay rescuer whether or not they're breathing or not. And they didn't know how to check to see if he had a heartbeat to check a pulse. So they kept saying, well, yeah, I think he's bleeding, breathing. I think he's breathing. And then finally, about seven minutes in, somebody said, I don't think he's breathing. Blood's coming out of his mouth. So then they were instructed to start CPR, which they didn't know how to do it. So then they had to give them further instructions. So it was seven minutes before he actually started to receive CPR. And that's seven minutes too long. So he died as a result of his injuries. And um, at that point, I was just amazed at how many people didn't know that they can actually get CPR trained. So, well, we're both extremely sorry to hear that. That's a very unfortunate situation. And hopefully for that company anyway, maybe they've taken CPR a little bit more serious. Hopefully everybody listening to this understands how serious this is. Any one of us can be in a situation where we could save somebody's life or vice versa. Something happens to one of us and hoping that others around us uh, no CPR for your mm-hmm. home, hopefully your wife, your kids, or, you know, you yourself on them. Um, everybody needs to know. But thank you very much for sharing that story. Yeah, you're welcome. And like I said, it's I just want people to know that it just it happened to me. And I'm a nurse. You know, you always think like, well, that kind of stuff doesn't happen to people, you know, and it does, you know, and I just thought it was important to kind of branch my little side hustle into something that could benefit more people. So that's how it all started. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing it. So that kind of gave you more of a passion to teach CPR then, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That's yeah, all. definitely. Definitely did. That's good. So for people that may not know, can you explain what CPR stands for, why it's important, and you know what it means to be certified? Sure. So CPR, and by the way, I always forget acronyms. I'm horrible with acronyms. <laughs> Um, I was like cardiopulmonary resuscitation because it just became so innate in me. It's like I teach CPR and I know exactly what it is. But when people ask like, what is CPR? I'm like, shoot, what is it? Oh, yeah. Cardiopulmonary (laughs) resuscitation. So basically you're learning how to pump the blood for someone who can't pump it themselves. Mm -hmm. And it involves more than just doing compressions. Um, It's a two-year certification. And, um, you know, obviously I think everyone should get it. Is that how long it's good for? When you get CPR certified, it's good for two years? Yeah. When you take a class, you get a uh, certification card and it's valid for two years for anyone, whether you're in healthcare or a a teacher or coach, whenever you get CPR training, they recommend renewing about every two years. Okay. Very good. In what situation would somebody need to know CPR? For instance, somebody might have heard your story, your testimony on your husband, and they might not think that CPR is something that could have helped that situation. So, you know, just kind of more broad. I know this is pool chasers and we're talking about swimming pools, which Mm -hmm. I think a lot more people associate CPR with swimming pools and bathtubs and things like that. But what are the situations where CPR is actually needed? CPR could be used in a variety of settings. And you're right. Most people think CPR drownings, but it could be something as simple as you're at a store and someone just collapses because you don't know when it's going to happen. Most of the time when people go into cardiac arrest, when their heart stops, 80% of the time it does happen outside the hospital setting, which is why it's so important that we have more people that are trained in CPR because you don't know when it's going to happen. And while we like to think that we're super healthy and and whatnot, from being a nurse from so many years in the emergency department, many of my patients that have come in in cardiac arrest were in great shape. And they were doing things like playing basketball and they collapse. Or, you know, they were driving 
and they got into a car accident. They think like, oh, well, they got in a car accident, but turned out they had a medical event. And when you have a heart defect, you don't always know that you even have it until your heart's under strain or it's just time and place. It could also be from choking. People can go into cardiac arrest from choking. And that's a big one if you have kids. Choking is a big, big one. And that's also part of CPR training. So we don't just teach how to revive someone. We also teach how to prevent it as well, because that's really the goal is to prevent cardiac arrest from happening. So we teach people how to relieve choking in adults, children, and infants. So ideally, it would be the goal of any CPR company to have CPR training for everybody. Is that realistic? Probably not. But the more people certified, the better chance of survival you give just about to anyone who goes into cardiac arrest. And what exactly is cardiac arrest? So that's actually a really good question. We get asked a lot in our classes because, you know, when you hear news stories, you hear like, oh, well, they had a heart attack or they went into cardiac arrest. Those are two different things. So cardiac arrest is what happens when anyone, whether they were a drowning victim, they were choking or they had a heart attack, their heart literally stops for whatever reason. It could be from a number of reasons. It could be from drug overdose. Drug overdose. That's a good one. It could be from lack of volume. Either they were dehydrated. And let's face it, this is Arizona. Mm -hmm. People dehydrate. We see it all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Every spring break, those people come out here from like, oh, let's go climb Camelback. I think it's just about to handle it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. They're like, don't take any water. There's no bathrooms. So they don't bring any water. And then they're climbing mountain. It's really hot. They dehydrate. And your body is like, what, 70% water? Mm -hmm. And there's just not enough volume for the heart to even pump. Or they're in a trauma and they lose their volume. Um, it could be from a severe infection. Your heart, when you when you have an infection, your body literally starts producing, it's called acidosis, but it, your body produces basically an acid. And it's kind of like, think of your heart as like your gas tank. Okay, if your gas tank goes dry, you ain't going anywhere. You get an electrical disturbance in your car, you're not going anywhere. Someone dumped acid in your gas tank, you're definitely not going anywhere. So all those reasons have to be addressed when somebody goes into cardiac arrest. Or, you know, I'm from the Midwest. We also lose people in the Midwest to hypothermia because they literally froze. Yep. So their heart stops from those reasons. The goal is to restart it. And the best way to restart it is just to be the pump. Start compressions. So what's a heart attack then? A heart attack is a blockage to the vessels of the heart. So the heart's actually two systems. It runs an electrical system and it runs a pump. And the pump is fueled by you know, little arteries that are giving it blood. So the heart has its own blood supply. Not only does it pump your blood, but it has a blood supply. And when the heart has a heart attack, there's a blockage in the blood supply to the heart, which causes it to arrest or start to feel that pain. Because most people, when they have a heart attack, it's kind of very similar. Like, have you ever sat on your foot and then after you've been sitting on your foot, your foot gets really tingly? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Because you cut off the blood supply. The same thing happens to the heart. So when someone has a blockage in their vessels... The blood supply is cut off. So they start to feel that tingle. And you already know, like, the real pain from your foot falling asleep isn't when it falls asleep. It gets kind of tingly. Where does the pain really start? When you get up and start moving. That mm-hmm. that blood starts flowing again. Tickles. Yeah. And then you get that incredible pain. And then you're like, you feel like you're going to die. And then you want to cut your foot off. And then it's fine. The heart <laughs> kind of does the same thing. Oh, God. This is the worst. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's why there's those, those different too. things where you've... They say when you feel certain things in certain parts of your body that you might want to be careful because like you could be about to have a stroke or you know mm-hmm. something something like that. Yeah, like changes in vision yeah. can be a sign of a stroke. Headache can be a sign of a stroke. Um, jaw pain. I can't tell you how many patients I had that came in and they're like, oh, I think I have that TMJ. And I'm like, sweetie, you're having a heart attack. Mm-hmm. And they're like, no, that's impossible. I do yoga. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's great. So you're What's still having TMJ? a heart attack. Uh, that mandible you know where like they, that pain you get from your mandible your jaw being off oh i don't sound like a sandwich <laughs> no it was PB&J. very trendy in the 90 to have tmj oh. probably like that clicking in your jaw you know never heard of that before <laughs> that's because you're younger <laughs> yeah you weren't old enough for oh the yeah TMJ i was crawling path. around <laughs> people smacking their teeth <laughs> people are gonna think like i'm a little low lighty <laughs> no the heart basically can stop for a number of reasons. Having an MI doesn't necessarily mean you'll go into cardiac arrest, but it certainly is a reason why the heart does stop because it's just not getting any flow to the muscle itself. So heart attacks can lead to cardiac arrest, but cardiac arrest is what happens to anyone that basically the heart just stops pumping. So, Right. And who should be CPR certified? Because it seems like it just covers like kind of a wide range 
you know, different types of situations. So in your eyes, who do you think should be CPR certified? Everyone. Um, it's a good answer. It That's is. That's what we were thinking. It is. Everyone. <laughs> Everyone should be certified. Um, several states have actually passed. Arizona's one of them has passed a law that every high school student will learn about CPR before they graduate. And Illinois passed a law. Um, most of the states where these laws have passed, it's been because there's been a tragic event and they want to prevent cardiac arrest from happening in the high school settings and in the, the younger grades. Um, we've had a couple kids here that have made the news with cardiac arrest and survived. Um, so uh, Illinois has a law. Arizona has a law. How they do their training they didn't really specify, but all students graduating from a high school in Arizona has to have some type of exposure to, doesn't mean they have to be certified. They just need to learn about it. Right. Well, being a nurse, are you seeing incidents where there are drownings from swimming pools and things like that? Yes. I've worked many drownings. Um, sometimes we'll have two in a day. Arizona is second in the nation, be right behind Florida in drownings because we have, I mean, we're in a desert, but you know, I'm from the Midwest. First thing I did when I moved out here was make sure I got a house with a pool. Right. Because we think it's going to be 120 and we're going to live in our pool. So everyone has a pool. Um, so yeah, we're number two in the country for drownings. It's pretty high. Yeah. Uh, that's super unfortunate. We're going to take a quick break, but when we get back, Carrie explains the fundamentals of CPR and what you will learn when you take a class. She also shares a few scenarios where knowing CPR would be beneficial when working around water. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is brought to you by Primate Pool Tools. By now you've heard us talk about our friends at Primate Pool Tools. Bottom line is that most pool poles are heavy or awkward to use. Don't you agree? Primate understands that and that's why all Primate poles are made with aerospace grade carbon fiber which offers 10 times the strength of aluminum at half the weight. The first time we used a primate pole, we could not believe how light it was and how easy it was to maneuver in the water. And primate pool tools continue to lead the way in carbon fiber technology by now offering stainless steel versions of their flagship 2X and 3X models that are ideal for heavy vacs, as well as custom limited edition designs and brand new custom grips. Best part is they're made here in the USA and they have a customer service department that will actually pick up the phone. So. What are you waiting for? Go to primatepooltools.net by clicking the link below or check them out by listening to episode 104 for all the details. So for people that might not have any idea about a CPR class, what exactly are they in for um, when doing this? Like how long does it take and what is actually involved in this in-person class? It doesn't take very long. It takes about two hours to get CPR trained. It's a very hands-on class. We do something that's called practice while watching. And we have a big screen TV, kind of like the one you guys have in here, <laughs> where we broadcast our little DVD. And it's got these little Sims men. We kind of make fun of them because they're Sims men. So they kind of walk and they arrive to the mannequin. And the, the idea dummies. is- Like the game yeah. Sims? <laughs> yeah, to the dummies, the dummies. There we go. <laughs> they do look like Sims men. <laughs> Actually, one of them looks like a grown-up version of Sid from Toy Story because he walks Ew. out and he's got like, it's, we kind of have fun with it because <laughs> it can be a very traumatic Sid? experience. Sid? You gotta put the like skull and crossbones t shirt yeah. on. <laughs> Sid Sid probably scared so many people. That guy. He did. He did. But yeah. um yeah, so they watch the they watch a little bit of a video and then the rest of it is hands on. Because the only way to learn CPR is to do CPR. Like you can't just watch and be like, Yeah, I think I got it. Because the mannequins, the ones that we have, they're called Preston. That's the name brand, and they have this really great spring in them that simulates a real chest. So when people push down on the chest, they're actually feeling what it is like to do a chest compression on a person. And then they can feel that chest kind of spring back up into place. So Would that happen if this was like a real person that's not breathing? Would they feel the chest spring? Yeah. Um, if they're well, I just mean, is it similar yeah. to like somebody that you would actually be doing CPR on? Yeah, it okay. is. It is. They feel they're meant to simulate a real chest, but the force that you need to push down on the chest, it's its a pretty significant amount of force. You're using your upper body strength and you're not bending your arms. Like television does a terrible job of showing CPR. They just do. Why? Why won't we just do it right? Well, because they usually have the actor still there, so they can't really push two inches in depth because that's how many inches you have to push, at least two inches in depth into a oh, chest. Wow. So it takes a great amount of force. 
And I mean, that's a pretty big depth to push into. So you can't really do that on a real person without causing some harm. So they typically have the people bend their arms so it looks like they're doing compressions, but they're not. So see, television CPR is, we call it Hollywood. I just ruined CPR. every uh, <laughs> ER drama for you. Yeah, you don't want to watch a medical <laughs> show with me. I mean, I don't know how it is for other professions, but you put any healthcare provider in front of a medical drama and we're like, what are they doing? <laughs> oh my gosh, that's not how you, sh that's not asystole. And we're, I yell at it like I yell at football. I mean, it's awful, but I'm sure lawyers do the same thing when oh, they're yeah, watching sure. Law and Order. I'm yep. like, that's not even a brief. Right. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, so I don't, that's the only word I know. <laughs> so what else is going on to a group of people and you're doing all this what exactly are people going to be learning um so in addition to learning cpr we teach the fundamentals so one of the things is when you arrive and you see a person on the ground we always teach them to make sure that the scene is safe or clear because you don't want to become a victim yourself and that also includes if you have to move the victim to a safe spot. And here in Arizona, we've got some areas that aren't necessarily ideal to do CPR. Like someone collapses in a parking lot here in the middle of July, you're going to burn your knees yeah. doing right. CPR. Yeah. I mean, I'm from the Midwest. My very first code that I was involved in with the patient in cardiac arrest in the emergency room, I, they were like, oh, he's got severe burns on his back. I'm like, what did they do to this guy? And like, oh, no, he's found on the pavement. I'm like, what did the pavement do to this guy? Um it was insane. I've never seen anything like it before, like blisters mm -hmm. from the heat burning their skin. And so if you were in the parking lot here, you'd want to move that person off to the shade somewhere so you can even be able to do CPR in July. Because it's not like you carry a pad around for your knees to do compressions. Um, and more specific to swimming pools, you know, it's probably a good idea to lay a towel down or something mm -hmm. like on the deck. And, yeah. You know. So we teach them to move to a safe spot and then to assess their victim. And we always teach them to kind of tap and shout. And you can't do a gentle tap and shout because if someone isn't responding, they're not going to respond to a little like, hey, are you okay? You got to like slap them a little, you know, slap them on their shoulders like, hey, hey, are you okay? So we teach them to do that on the actual little mannequin. And we teach them to kind of, you know, don't teach them to slap them, but we teach them to kind of tap on their shoulders pretty roughly to get their attention. If they don't respond... We just tell people they're not responding. You don't see any movement. Just start CPR because that's what they're going to need. And the good thing about it is if you're wrong, I guarantee for that first compression, they're going to tell you. Be like, dude, I'm okay. It was like, next time you answer me. <laughs> give them one more. Um, <laughs> and you just Cause have if Because if they're breathing or if they have, it's going to hurt, right? Is it, if they're saying? alive, it will. But on yeah. Cardiac arrest doesn't look like people think it's going to. A lot of times people do what's called agonal breathing, and they're taking almost like a snoring-like respiration. Mm. So it may look like they're still alive because there's still air in your lungs. Like they're just, they're just big, giant balloons. So when they're laying there flat or whatever position you find them in, air is going to be escaping so it looks like they're breathing. If they don't respond to you, just start. And then if they do start responding, then you stop. You're like, sorry about that. I thought you were dead. And if they're mad at you, well, that's on them. But you've got to at least try. So you start those compressions. And then we also teach about what they call it the chain of survival, so when to call for help. And basically, we tell people to call for help right away. A lot of what we teach in our classes, um, some of it's getting a little antiquated, if you will, because we teach people like, you know, tell someone to go call for help. Or if you're all alone and it's an adult, go get help and then come back and do compressions. But that's going back to the day and age where there was like one phone in the house. And some people don't even know this. The phone used to be attached to the wall with a cord. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I thought like it was always just in your pocket. No, no, no. It's, these, are, these are new. So I still refer to my phone sometimes and be like, oh, where's my car phone? It's my cell phone, but I still call it a car phone because that's the only, the only way you used to go mobile was mm -hmm. in the car. Mm -hmm. So we didn't always have access to telephones readily um actually in one of the aha videos we do kind of have a little fun with our people because when they show the video they're standing outside the park and a man collapses that's not funny but then they say to the crowd the one guy says does anyone have a phone and there's 10 people standing there and not one person has a cell phone and then someone goes i think i saw a pay phone and i was like where what decade was this filled in? there's no pay phones i mean when was the last time you saw a pay phone so then someone's like there's a pay phone just outside the park <laughs> So the guy goes and runs to get the payphone. I'm like, this would never happen. Someone would be recording with their phone. Someone would be like, Siri, call 911. And she'd be like, calling Rosati's. And I'm like, 
later, call 911. And now you got watches that have phones in them. So that's really kind of taken a lot of that call for help almost immediately. I mean, you can even, you don't have one in here. You can even have Alexa call 911. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. say you're by yourself. I I feel like that would be a pretty common situation that, Mm -hmm. you know, you're by a pool, something happens. I mean, how long is that going to take? I mean, are you doing CPR and like, I mean, because I'm assuming your natural reaction might not be to get on the phone. Like, how long is that phone call going to take? Should you just get right into CPR? I'm just saying for an instance that you're by yourself. What do you, what should you do? You're by yourself and you witness the person collapsing. They say you find them. You find them call for help, and then start compressions. Um, And while you're calling for help, they always say it's ideal to put it on speakerphone because they can talk you through things. But again, you're calling someone who has no idea what you're looking at. So they're going to try to make an assessment of what you're seeing based on what you tell them. So they'll ask things like, are they breathing? Can you put your ear down by their chest? Listen for breaths. Do you see any movement from their chest? You know, and then they'll try to instruct you on how to do CPR, which can be very difficult to do over the phone. Yeah. And especially, how do you know if they're getting the right rate and the right depth? Um, and they'll teach you things like you can sing Staying Alive, um, that song by yeah. the Bee Gees, which a lot of the kids don't know anymore. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I do, too. I still remember that video. I still have that on album. <laughs> I was about to start singing it. Come on. I won't it. start singing it. You although can do it. <laughs> having this microphone here is so tempting. I know. Oh my gosh. I'd be in here every day making my own little videos. <laughs> we do. So I am curious. I don't want to forget this. Does anything change when performing CPR on somebody that has drowned it opposed to anything else? No. Um, other than getting them out of the water. So let's say you did come across someone that was, you know, you're in their back, you go in their backyard, right? Because I'm imagining, you know, you come in, you see someone in the pool. First, you always make sure that the scene is safe. Like, why would they be collapsed in their pool? Were they swimming and they had a cardiac event? Um, Because we always think kids, but it's not always kids. Um, Is there something wrong with the pool? I mean, oh, God, I saw Friday the 13th. Remember that hot tub scene where they heated it up really hot? I don't remember that. I don't remember it either. You don't remember that one? Mm -mm. It's Michael Myers. Okay, who was Michael Myers? Halloween. 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 Thank you. It was Halloween. Remember he heated the hot tub and he boiled those people? Oh, my God. (laughs) I knew that dude was a pool guy. I knew it. (laughs) That he was knew like, how to bypass those settings to get it above. Yeah, he did. And he boiled the people in their hot tub. And that was like my biggest fear when we got so a hot good. tub. I'm like this. Is it too hot? I don't want to just get in because I don't want to be Michael Myers. Yeah. That was Halloween. Oh, I forgot. Halloween. My yeah. So you want to look to see what could cause them to collapse. I would think an ele- electrical with the wire would be another common one. So, yeah. You know. That. Yeah. That's that's a big concern. You know, we put lights in our pools. So you want to make sure those are always in working order and things like that. But it could be electrical. So you want to make sure that you don't become a victim yourself. Or jumping off the roof because I've done that. Yeah. Oh, you jump off a roof that. and hit your head on the yeah, um, don't do that. We're not giving permission <clears throat> for that. I'm just yeah, saying you dis- might be thinking like disclaimer. what, what yeah, could possibly disclaimer. happen to an adult. Right. Um, mm-hmm. But like an adult could very well, you know, jump off their roof mm-hmm. or something stupid like that. And yeah. they're, you know what I mean? Oh, my gosh. That that happens more than you know. People well, jumping sure, off their I'm roof. Sure or, it does. You yeah. know, try to jump into their pool from their roof. And it's like, what would you, why would you, you have a diving board. Or they're not diving pools. A lot of these pools here in Arizona are like play pools. They're not that deep. Right. It's like, you can't jump off your roof. <laughs> yeah. Why'd you dive? <laughs> like, what, anyway, what pull, them out, pull them out of the water. <laughs> so you got to pull them out of the water. You got to pull them out of the water and then, you know, get them on their back and start compressions. Now water is going to be coming out of them and they may also vomit. But that doesn't mean they're alive. And that's one of the other mistakes people make. And this is going to be a little gross. But when you do CPR, it's not like you know when the person had their last meal. So that air that's in them and when you start pumping, you're pushing air further down into their stomach, which just means their body's not releasing that air yet. So it's going to start coming backwards and they may start vomiting up water. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're alive. You keep going on the compressions until help arrives and it can be a while average response time in arizona can be anywhere from seven minutes and up to get an ambulance depending where you are and i don't know if you notice people here do not move to the right for sirens and lights like they do not they almost get mad like oh i can't believe this guy wants me to move over because he's got his lights on it's like yeah move to the right for sirens and lights 
Um, so it could be a while for help to get there and you just keep going on the compressions. You don't have to make any modifications for drowning victims. You just do the compressions. Okay. So maybe you could walk us through like, like a scenario, like what exactly would you do? Say you get them out of the pool and they're laying there. I know it's, you learn all this stuff in class, but maybe mm -hmm. you could just kind of walk through what exactly you'd be doing. Okay. So you arrive. And of course we always make sure the scene is safe. There, oh my God. We do that in class. <laughs> they say it's so much at the end. It's I actually got my mom doing it. Like we'll walk through a parking lot and she's like, it's clear. It's clear. <laughs> I'm like, not here, mom. Um, so we'll teach them to arrive on scene, make sure the scene is safe, safe. and then approach the victim. Tap, shout, see if they're okay. If they don't respond, you don't see any breathing. It doesn't look like normal breathing. You're going to put your hands in position. And the best way we tell people to find the position, because if you read the books, they're always like, find the lower two-thirds of the breastbone. The what? Where? What is two-thirds anyway? Yeah. I don't even know what two-thirds is. So the best way to tell people to find the center of the chest is to find their armpits, because everyone has an armpit. Even if you don't have arms, you have an armpit. So to find the armpit and you slide the base of your hand, the bottom of your hand, from the armpit right to the center of the chest. And don't worry about if, you know, you're, it's the woman, okay? Because I get that question a lot, like, oh, my gosh, what if it's woman, you know, and I touch her breast? I'm like, don't worry. It's fine. And they're going to flop to the side. So <laughs> they're women. I mean, is she is – she did she respond when you said, are you okay? <laughs> are you okay? If she She's, said, yes, I'm fine. Do yeah, not don't, continue. Don't start doing it. Like we have a method. We'll tell people like, they're like, oh my God, I'm so afraid. I might touch a breast. I'm like, look, there's two ways to do it. Okay. If you're afraid, you have to push a breast out of the way. Use the back of your hand. We call that the professional. Grabbing them is more of the party. So professional party. <laughs> <laughs> so we do a little demo because that is a concern. People are always concerned about, oh, women don't always get bystander CPR because they're afraid of our breasts are going to kill us one way or the other. I just know it. But they're always afraid like, oh, what if I touch their breast? It's fine. Your hand shouldn't be on their breast during CPR. It's in the center of the chest. So just start from the armpit, slide your hand over. You should find that nice little groove in there. And that's where you're going to aim for. And then you just push down with everything you got. The good thing is, is you really can't push too deep because there's other stuff inside the body. Um, our mannequins have a stop plate, so they can only get that two inches in depth. And you push down. And the big thing is not just pushing down, making sure what goes down comes all the way up. So you just want to start and you start pumping. We've kind of put breathing on the side right now because people are a little queasy about breathing on people. Like no one was excited about it before either when we would train people in compressions are like do I have to breathe on them I'm like it's your grandma breathe on her but now with the virus people are like I don't care if it's my husband I'm not giving them breaths there it makes them a little queasy so so are you doing the compressions first or breathing compressions are first breathing secondary there's enough air in the room for them to get oxygen through they'll be fine without that you've got to pump the oxygen that's in their blood and they got about a 10 minute supply so start pumping Okay. Well, there's a difference too. I think, you know, when you're not certified, then when you are an expert in it, right? So that's, that also comes into play with the breathing mm -hmm. is if you don't know much about it, compressions is what you're supposed to do. Exactly. And not really mess with their head and neck. And then, mm -hmm. but if you're an expert, then you move on to the other stages, right? right? Yeah. yeah. But even like right now, this is just a, a weird time. People yeah, are very yeah. concerned. Like, sure. can you imagine going to a birthday party, watching someone blow out candles right now? <laughs> Be like, Boy. I'm not eating that cake. That's a COVID <laughs> cake. I'm not touching it. I mean, no one is going to touch that cake if you blow on this candle. Well, it's like weird being in a place and hearing somebody cough or sneeze. Like, I know, it's, it's pretty crazy how fast. Their head. Yeah. I'm like, get the hell out of here. How <laughs> dare you sneeze in here, you filthy animal? <laughs> It's like, I have, you almost want to wear a shirt like, I have seasonal allergies, right. okay? Yeah. Don't you know there's a pandemic going on, <laughs> asshole? <laughs> yeah, I know. People get a little a little crazy about the sneezing or the coughing, and it's like, I'm, I just was, it wasn't a cough. It was, it was just clearing my throat. Even, I'll do that too when I'm teaching. My throat gets a little sore because I'm, I'm kind of, like, I'm not yelling at them, but, you know, we're excited when we teach. We keep the energy pretty high when we're teaching, so I'm pretty loud. Um, and I and I'm talking and I'm talking over the sound of it because our mannequins actually make a little sound. And when you have twelve of them going at once, it gets a little noisy. So I've got to be noisier than the mannequins. So by the midway through the class, my throat starts getting a little scratchy. I'm like, I don't have COVID. 
I'm just my throat's I'm just gonna drink real quick. So I try to stay pretty hydrated. <laughs> I ain't believing it. I feel like everybody's got their excuse. Oh, uh, I've been talking all day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, you got the cove. You start getting a little sweaty. You're like, it's just because it's 114. You got the it's not. She's got the Fresno beach. You got the COVIDs. You got to yeah. put an S on it. I got the COVIDs. <laughs> I got the, the mid- COVIDs. In the Midwest, we get the COVIDs. <laughs> so what is that? How many compressions are you doing? And what does that rhythm look like? You're talking about um, the BG song. Like how exactly, I'm assuming you're like locking um, your arms mm-hmm. and you're pushing down. Mm-hmm. Like what exactly is the rhythm of that? So you want to go at a rate of 100 to 120. So basically... Just go for it. I mean, no one's going to fault you for going a little too fast. Per minute. Per minute. 100 to 120 per minute. Now, when you're in our classes, our mannequins actually have these really cool feedback lights on their shoulders. Now, real people don't have feedback lights, but our mannequins do, and they have um, a series of lights. So if it gives you like a little red flasher, and this kind of helps train that muscle memory. So if we start flashing red, too slow. Getting a single yellow light, still too slow. One green, you're almost there. Two greens, you're in the zone. So he gives you these two green lights. And then when you really get going too fast, he starts flashing yellow. And then he shocks you until you stop it. Because <laughs> technically, how he many does. Does not shock compressions you. is that like in a, you're trying to do like one and a half a second? You're trying to get 100 to 120 per minute. So in about an 18 second cycle, you should be able to get about 30 compressions every 18 seconds seconds that's math i can't do so i just know that in about 30 seconds you should be able to get or in uh, 18 thought, seconds you should be able saying, to get at least 30 that's, that's what i'm getting fast. at is it is pretty it's pretty fast it's pretty it's, it's pretty, pretty fast quick. yeah yeah and yeah. you're trying to go that about like two inches you said where mm-hmm. you're putting all that force down mm-hmm. and you got to keep continuously your, doing it. you got to keep your arms locked you don't want to bend your elbows because you don't want your arms doing the work you actually want your upper body kind of like rocking into them um, putting your weight into mm-hmm. it. Yeah. Yeah. And we teach them different ways they can hold their hands. Cause depending on the age of the person doing the CPR, like you can interlock your hands, like you're doing like a volleyball serve and that works. You can also just lay your hands on top of each other or grasp your wrist. That's actually how they train in Canada. They do this little, uh, wrist grab thing. Hmm. Um, we call that the Canadian, uh, it's just how they train to grasp your wrist. Um, So you could do a couple different methods. The goal, though, is to keep those arms nice and straight. Shoulders should be above your hands. So you're kind of just like moving in one solid motion. You don't want to come in from the side. You just want to hover those shoulders right over the center of the chest and just push as hard as you can and as fast as you can and start getting that little beat. We mentioned the song, you know, Staying Alive by the Bee Gees, which is available on iTunes. No, I don't know. (laughs) I can't tell, by the way. (laughs) But it's not that part of it. That was a pretty good. No, it's the... Staying alive, yeah. staying alive. <laughs> don't do it to that. Beat. Don't getting, do it to that. <laughs> <laughs> we actually teach for the younger kids because um, they don't always know that. So uh, there is this dreadful song. Baby, baby. baby, baby oh. <laughs> no, Baby Shark. Oh, Baby Shark. Shark, oh, Baby, oh, baby Shark. 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 Yeah. I, uh, I, yeah, we got the, we got the Bieber reference. Shark, Speaking do, of Canadians. Do, 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 do. Baby, baby Shark. shark do, 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 do. That's a lot. Yeah. Baby, baby Shark. Do, do, That's quick. Yeah. Baby shark works, and then so does row, row, row your boat. Mm. So that's definitely an old one. Yeah, but it because everyone knows <laughs> row, row, row your boat. I mean, I don't want to be talking to some ten year old be like, well, you know the Bee Gees, and they're like the what? Yeah, <laughs> Justin Bieber, what? <laughs> Is that a Drake song? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> row, row, what? row your boat. But you're trying to, I mean, you're trying to mimic a real heartbeat, right? Mm-hmm. So that it's pumping. Yeah blood as fast as it would normally or try to get to that. Try to. The thing is with CPR is you're never going to really emulate what the body can do. Right. Because the heart normally only beats between 60 and 100 beats per minute. And we're telling you to go faster. That's because your compressions are only going to move about 25% of the blood volume that the heart normally does. So you have to go faster than that normal 60 to take it up to about 120 just to be able to circulate about 25% of the blood. And why do we need to circulate the blood? Well, your blood has oxygen, and that needs to get to your brain. Because unlike what we do on TV, we cannot print a new 3D brain. We can't do a brain transplant. The brain is the control center, and we need to be able to get oxygen to their brain. The goal is to improve their survival, because we can bring a lot of people back, but we want quality when they come back. So we want them to have perfusion 
or blood flow to their brain. And that's why it's so important. You just got to start pumping on that chest. That's why the breaths are really secondary because you're not only, only thing you're doing with your breath, breaths is you're forcing air that's in the room into their lungs. And they're going to get that naturally. Some of it's going to go in. So focus on the compressions because that's the key because you got to got to circulate that blood to get the oxygen to the brain. But the goal is to make that oxygen moving to flow so that when the emergency people get there, they can revive them and mm-hmm. they're better chance of yeah. being normal again or as close to normal as you can be. You know, if you don't, if they lay there for seven plus 10 minutes, there's no oxygen going into their brain. So their chances of, even if they do revive them, are not gonna be that good. Exactly. We're gonna take another quick break. But when we get back, Carrie talks about using an automated external defibrillator how often you should get certified, and why it's so important to stay under control in an emergency situation. This episode of the Pool Chasers podcast is supported by Pool RX. Well, it's that time of year again. Pool RX is having their spring big sale event. That means it's time for you to stock up for the summer. When we're running Brothers, this was one of our favorite times of year. We got a discount on the product, but more importantly, we were setting our pools up to be successful and reducing chemical usage, which saved us a ton of time and money. Let me tell you a little bit more about the product. Polarex eliminates and prevents all types of algae, reduces chlorine demand, and lasts up to six months. With Polarex, there is no need for phosphate removers, clarifiers, or other algicides. When using Polarex, you will see high-definition water clarity. I mean, the pools just pop. Right now, you can get $15 off a four-pack of blue units and $17.50 off a four-pack of black units at your favorite distribution location. The sale ends April 30th, so get them while you can. If you want to find out more about the product and how you can reduce your chlorine usage this summer, check out episode 142, visit PolarX.com, or click the link below. We also teach in the class, in addition to just teaching the CPR and the choking, we teach them how to use something called an AED, and it's an automatic external defibrillator. And you may have seen them, like in airports and stuff, you'll see the AED is here. Or if you ever go up into Sedona, they have them in certain restaurants along the way. Um, say a lot of like office buildings mm-hmm. and stuff like that. They're required in federal buildings and state buildings, excluding schools. But most schools do have them. Um, you may see them in office buildings. Uh, the Banner hospitals have put them in the parking garages as well. Because a lot of people that drive themselves to the hospital, they don't always call 911. Um, just because they don't want to spend the money on an ambulance and be wrong it's like so they drive themselves and they could have a a cardiac event in a parking garage so you'll see them all over the place and the more you start looking for them the more prominent they become like they have them at the scottsdale mall um and what exactly did those do so those are very important in our chain of survival because a lot of times when a person collapses especially an adult but it can happen with kids too The heart doesn't just stop, it fibrillates. Basically, it looks like a ball of jello in the chest jiggling. So think of it as the electrical system in the heart has gone completely haywire. And it's so it's crazy. And the best way to stop crazy is to shock it. Like right now, if I told you there was- To give it crazy. Yeah, to get rid of the crazy, we tase it, right? Like if I told you there was a guy running down the runway right now, pretending he was a wild buffalo and he was naked. Tase him. Tase him. And the heart's doing the same thing. It's pretending it's a little naked wild buffalo just jiggling around in your chest. And the only way to stop it is to shock it. And that is what most people's hearts do when they go into cardiac arrest. It goes into this shockable rhythm. So by placing these AEDs out there for the general public to use, we can actually restore their normal rhythm before EMS even gets there. And that's the goal. So we teach... In our CPR class, for the for anyone that wants to learn how to use an AED, they get to put the pads on, and they're they're simulated, so they're not actually going to get shocked, but it works just like it. it. Literally, the first step to it is just to power it on, and it just tells you to do the rest. Like you turn it on, it's like place pad. Some of them are pretty handy. Um, like when you turn it on, it's like remain calm and call nine one one, and you're like, okay, okay, I'm calm. All right, I called nine one one, and then it tells you the next step, like place pads on patient, and then it will look at the patient's heart rhythm and determine if it needs to be shocked. And if it does, it tells you, it's like, charging, stand clear. And they talk just like that. And that's my goal someday is to be the voice of the AED. (laughs) You'll get there. I think so. Or Samuel L. Jackson. I think that'd be cool. I'd be like, now I said clear. (laughs) Clear, man. Did you call 911? (laughs) So is this this something that could help a drowning? Yeah. 
Yep. Because when the heart stops, you don't know exactly what is going to cause the heart to stop. Was it a cardiac event that they had while they happened to be in the water? It happens. Kids, it can happen to them. Adults. Um, it could be a choking incident too. You know, like I have a swim up bar in my pool because I'm fancy. <laughs> Look at you. Oh, you're fancy, huh? I did. Well, if I'm going to have a bar, it's going to be in the water. <laughs> That's where we watch football in the fall. That's awesome. In front of the swim up bar. It's a big selling point to my Chicago relatives when they come out. Heck yeah. It's kind of my bragging. Like, well, we have a swim up bar. So we tend to eat in our pool a lot because you have a swim up bar, you have to eat in the pool. Oh, for sure. Um, yeah. It's just fancy. <laughs> it's how you really make those Chicagoans jealous. Have a swim up bar. So it could be from another number of reasons, but often the heart, they say it's like something over 87% of the time, it is a shockable rhythm that a person presents in. So having an AED by a public pool definitely does help. And you will see them at pools. You'll see they have um, AEDs everywhere. What do they look like? Um, They kind of, well, say they, I used to say they look like little records, (laughs) like old recorders from the eighties, but most people don't know what a recorder is from the eighties. Not like the (laughs) flute one you play, but a cassette recording tape. It kind of looks like the flux capacitor from back to the future, like the Mm. the case for it. Yeah. 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 It kind of looks like it's a little, it does looks like a little money case. A lot of times they're in a hard shell case and then the device itself is not very big. looks like a, like an old computer out of the 80s and there's these little sticky pads you put on and there's pictures like they made them super user friendly a certain color or um they can be yellow they could be white um there's one brand they're circular so they just look like a space thing um but most of them are kind of a like a square Hmm. so and we have little practice ones for everyone to try and they light up and they flash and it talks you through it and then the cool thing about using the aed is that a lot of them, you know, they tell you like shock advised and clear, you know, and then the light flashes red and it's like press the shock button now and then you shock and then it tells you resume CPR and then it starts doing a little <coughs> to keep track. So you're supposed to click when it clicks. Wow. Yeah. So That's it's pretty awesome. It is pretty amazing that they do that. And it's got like a little chip in it. So EMS can take their, or, you know, firemen and our paramedics can take that little chip and we can put it into a computer and it will tell us what it recorded. So mm. how long CPR was in progress, what rhythm it shocked, how many times it shocked, because the person doing compressions has got a lot going on. They're not going to remember all that information. They're not, you know, especially if they don't have a medical background, they're going to be like, I don't know, what time did it start? Uh, it's going to feel like a, a little time has passed. It may only been a few minutes, but for that person, it may seem like a few hours have passed or you know, 30, 40 minutes. And in reality, it was only two or three. So it gives a nice recording of what happened. They're kind of like the black box of a plane, but right there. At a yeah. Pool. So, and they sell them at Costco. Oh, really? Yeah. And Amazon. You can get <laughs> anything on Amazon. <laughs> anything. Mm-hmm. Anything. Sorry, Jeff Bezos. So in your opinion, do you think two years is too long? Because I think people may think that you get this certificate and all is good, but you probably need to ask yourself if a situation was to happen, do I really do I really remember all the steps I need to take in doing that? Like in your opinion, what do you how often do you think you should be doing it? If you don't do it, then you should probably renew at least yearly. Yeah. But the certificates are valid for two years. That's the minimum. Just because that's the minimum doesn't mean you can't do it more. If you're not it's not something you're gonna use, then by all means, definitely you know, attend another refresher class. We always tell our students too, like if you just want to come back and sit through another class, you don't want to get certified again, come back and sit through another class. Let us know you're coming, especially now because we have limited seating. Um, You know, we'll let you come back in and sit through a whole new class all over again because you've already got the certification. You might just need a little refresher. And even in the hospitals, we do little refreshers. We have little mock scenarios that will run just to keep us sharp because a well-performed team does a lot better than, you know, just kind of faking it till you make it. Right. So we definitely encourage that. Um, we work with several different up here in the Scottsdale area. We go to a couple churches and, oh my God, those are my favorite groups to go to because they are they want to do it. They want to learn about it. And we'll have little 80 and 90 year olds and they're getting down on the ground. They're learning how to do CPR. And I'm just like, you go, you get them. Um, and we can make some modifications for training because, you know, CPR training, like we typically train on tables. And so we have stools to elevate people because that's more of a healthcare type setting. But in the, 
you know, someone collapses in a pool, you're not going to be like, quick, get the table. You know, you're going to do CPR where they're at, but adrenaline's going to kick in for you. So you're not going to feel your knees burning on the pavement. You're not going to feel that pain in your back when you first start doing, comp- it's the next day you're going to feel it. So we do, you know, that fight or flight reflex takes in and all of a sudden you've got the strength to do it. Yeah. Do you do any pool companies? Like, do you do any kind of like house calls, I guess? where you go to a pool company's office? We do go to offices um, from time to time. We can do um, groups on site and things like that. And um, just depending on, you know, how how well set up their office is because you need a little space to spread out and do compressions. Obviously, it's easier at our place because it's kind of like making a house call. Um, but there are times we can go to your office and things like that. Now that we seem to be opening up the world a little more, we're mm-hmm. definitely heading out and seeing more offices trained. We train a wide variety of people from, you know, healthcare to, you know, the cell phone towers. We train those groups that assemble the cell phone towers. They have to have CPR training. Warehouses have to have it. So it's coaches, teachers, things like that. So we get a wide variety of different settings that want to have CPR training. Yeah. And we, you know, we're thinking back when we had our pool service company that, you know, we should have been CPR certified. And as new team members came in, they should have been certified. And not so much that, you know, a technician might run into somebody that is drowning or something like that, but you should know it, understand it, and be able to communicate that to the customer. Because at the end of the day, I think that the person that owns a swimming pool should know it in and out. And you should have that knowledge to speak to them about like this is CPR. This is where you can get trained. I can send you an email. There's information on my website, like you, your husband, your kids, everybody needs to know this stuff. So we're that, you know, everybody's aware. And if an incident does happen, you know, there's birthday parties, you know, and it doesn't even matter. Somebody doesn't have a pool. Like you go on vacation at a hotel or you're at the beach or there's so many different situations. Um, just, and that's just water. Mm -hmm. Um, there's just so many situations where, um, you can step in to, to help. And like I said earlier, and vice versa, you would hope that if something ever happened to you, that the people around you, somebody would know CPR. And I think that's probably a really good way to look at it. Like if you were drowning or you had a situation, wouldn't you hope, wish that people around you knew CPR? Mm-hmm. Probably yes. Um, and if that's the way that you're thinking, then you should do your part and be CPR certified. In your eyes, do you think that everybody that is around a pool should be CPR certified? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we tend to think that, like, oh, I have this barrier up. Okay. I don't know if you've ever met a three-year-old, but three-year-olds are pretty ambitious. And when there's something they want, they're going to go after it. And from experience working in the emergency room, when I've had patients that have been victims of drowning, or we call them near drowning when we revive them, they were near drowning, um, usually there is some type of barrier in place and kids are fast they're fast or there was a broken latch and when you are the person who's coming to you know do the maintenance to the pool you're kind of looked at like as an expert so people will ask you questions about it like well hey do you think I need to have CPR it's like well absolutely you have a pool you know you don't know when an event's going to happen it's just kind of like the responsibility of a pool owner you know like we require them to get a fence but then we don't teach them what to do should there be an emergency it's like that's great we got you a fence but what do you do if someone collapses you're going to go find a neighbor. You're going to wait for the ambulance. You can't wait for the ambulance. You have to be able to act. And again, your 911 operators, they do a fantastic job, but you are listening to them. You can't see what they're visualizing. You're panicked to begin with, and you're trying to learn a new skill at the same time. Not the easiest thing in the world to do. And that's the other thing, right, is learning how to stay under control. A lot of people do panic and freak out, and they're it just, everything becomes like blurry. Um, you know, some people are better at, than others, but you have to be able to take a deep breath and assess the situation and just slow down. It's mm-hmm. like, let's make, let's make good decisions because if we freak out, like nothing good is going to become of that. And that's difficult, but that's the way that you got to do it. Shit has to happen and you got to be able to just be calm and collective and just run through the motions. Like, okay, I'm going to call 911, put on speakerphone. I'm going to tap on their shoulder. Hey, are you awake? Are you okay? Not responsive. I'm communicating with the person on the other end of the phone after calling 911. And I'm going to start doing compressions while they're sending somebody out. I'm trying to 
And I think that something else is being aware of where you're at at all times, mm-hmm. you know, so that if you can hopefully say the address, but, you know, being able to access that, like, you know, we use like pool service software, like Skimmer, like being able to access that address right away mm-hmm. um, because that's, that's key. They have no, I mean, they could probably have some kind of crazy caller ID, but being able to tell them where you're at. Oh yeah. I'm at uh, cactus and, you know, hundredth and da, 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 da. You know, just because there's there's things that you need to be able to answer. So kind of being on your A game mm-hmm. um, all the time is probably super key. Yeah, I think as a nurse, one of the most valuable things I've had in my training on how to teach was actually being able to hear 911 calls, like hearing my own husband's 911 call, like just the calamity that went behind it. And the 911 operator is like, OK, well, where are you? Because he was inside a building. And they're trying to, like, give directions, too, on where they're at. They're like, we're in the left building. And they're like, is that on the west or the east side of the parking? I mean, you know, left? What? <sighs> you know, you want to have good directions, um, know where you're at, and be able to communicate what you're seeing and accurately describe it. Because, you know, they kept saying, like, well, I think he's breathing. Oh, wait, no, he's not breathing. No, he is breathing. How do they tell you to do compressions if they don't know? I mean, they can't see what you're seeing. So until we get some kind of video technology, it's not like you can FaceTime with your 911 operator. Um, They're just, they're operating by what you're telling them. And they're really good at deciphering what you're telling them in all the panic and all the, you know, and they're pretty good at getting you to calm down too. That's the good thing. That's why we want people to call 911 right away because then they get that like expert there that's got that calming voice that that just 911 operators just do. Mm-hmm. It's going to be difficult, but your chances are so much greater if you could just pull yourself together. One of the best examples, I always think about this, um, is that movie Taken with Liam Le- Neeson. Yeah, where, you know, you can't even imagine, you know, your father to this daughter, she's another country, and he's asking her questions like, stay calm, like when they're going to come in and take you, but you need to tell me what kind of shoes they're wearing and keep the phone on speakerphone so I can hear their voice. So there's all these different things as much as you want to panic and be pissed and all these different emotions. Like he understood that, you know, if we're both calm through this, our chances, my chances of finding you are, are better. So let's just move through this. And like, that's the best way to kind of like, think about it, like keep yourself under control. Everybody wants to freak out. Like all of us do, but your chances are so much greater if you just keep yourself under control Mm -hmm. and just do what somebody tells you or just figure things out and not think about like, oh, this person's going to die. They're going to die. Like just, hey, like let's save them by keeping ourselves together and doing exactly what we're supposed to. Yeah. It's almost like you want to slap yourself. Yeah. Ah. Oh, you might need to. That's what (laughs) you might need to slap yourself. I don't know how good of a slap you can do, but yeah, just trying to keep people calm is, is always is always difficult. But that's why those 911 operators, they're really good at what they do. I mean, they'll tell mm-hmm. you like, okay, you know, sir, ma'am, you know, can, what, did, what are you seeing? Can you tell me? And they really do a good job at trying to talk people down because they are often hysterical. So just trying to keep them calm. And then when they do arrive to the, like, to the hospital setting, we usually try to have someone when the family's with them, like explain what's going on because it's kind of horrifying to watch. Like when you're doing it, it's one thing, but when you're watching it, it's just an absolute horrifying scene so we always try to either get them out of the room but they they do allow family to stay well pre-covid i need to clarify that right now they're not letting a lot of people in but um you know explaining them to what's happening because it is kind of a scary thing to watch i I don't even like to watch it and like i said when you watch tv everybody lives their compressions they don't even break a sweat they're wearing makeup the victim's wearing makeup (laughs) you know they all look so great when they do it they're like oh we got them back i'm like wow they're so good (laughs) <laughs> didn't break a sweat <laughs> didn't, they didn't even break a rib um. right <laughs> all right well we've reached our last break when we get back we talk about the different materials you receive when becoming cpr certified how you can use them from a marketing standpoint and how being certified brings another level of professionalism to your business this episode of the pool chasers podcast is supported by natural chemistry nc brands is offering solutions for pool professionals in 2021 And they don't just mean awesome products like Pro Series Pro Blend or Pool Perfect Max, which will help increase the efficiency of any pool program. NC has also launched the new Pro Series Pool and Spa app, designed for professional use only. This app provides expert water analysis and the ability to store customer information, including photos of the backyard and water testing history. 
You can even email a visit report to your customers with the unique feature that links right to your smartphone's email function. Not only that, but NC now has two new training opportunities for dealers this year. One option for live, customized sessions, and another one consisting of key training topics in a module or optional quiz format. To hear more about it, listen to episode 135, or check them out by going to naturalchemistry.com or ncprotraining.com, and you can even click the link below. So from a business standpoint, what are some different materials that once you get certified that maybe you can put on your website? Because I think that would be a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, from a you know marketing standpoint, I mean, you really need to know this stuff, but it would be nice to say that you know your company, especially if you're getting everybody certified, that there are things that you can put on there to show homeowners mm -hmm. that you know you are certified, but also you know it's an additional resource they can maybe click on it and go to a website or something. So what are some of the things that come along with it marketing wise? Um, market, you can, you do get a certificate and it prints either a full page or a little card. So we actually display our certificates of training in our office. That's always a good thing. Like, Hey, look, we are trained. Yeah. Um, and then having links, because again, you're the expert coming into that family on their pool. Like, and they may ask you like, Hey, if we want to get that CPR training, do you know how I go about that? And you certainly want to be like, Oh no, or I ah, don't need that. Um, because they might need it. So wouldn't it be better to be like this wealth of information that you could provide them with? Because it's to them, it's pool related. You know, like, oh, gosh, we were thinking about getting the kids and my wife and I CPR train. Where could we go? And it's always good to have a connection. And it, it, may, it might be my Chicago background, too, because in Chicago area, we're always like, oh, don't worry, I got a guy for that. I got a guy. He's going to come in. He's going to hook you up. Yeah. And then I show up. And they're like, oh, I thought it was a guy. I'm like, yes, that's who I am. I'm the guy for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I know I'm, I like personal referrals too, you know, just cause it is more personal, you know, they're probably going to ask you other referrals too, like, Oh, who can do my landscaping? You know, and you're like, okay, I can't do your whole backyard, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just kind of having that as like a little, you know, being seen as an expert on the area that you're working in. And while it might not seem like something that they necessarily know a lot about CPR itself, but at least they go like, well, I got trained here. They were really great, you know, I was in and out. Um, and, you know, there's a couple different ways we offer the class now. We even have like a hybrid version. So people seem to really like that where they do like the videos and stuff at home. So they've already seen all the videos. So when they come in, they're just doing the skills. And so people kind of enjoy that version too. Um, and that one's been around for over a decade with the AHA, but it kind of came to light with the pandemic right. and we're like oh wow i could do part of this at home and it's like yeah absolutely we always talk about being professional and that's just another level of professionalism in in my opinion because we talk a lot about when you're doing bids or you're building pools or things that you should be explaining water safety to people and it doesn't get talked about enough and i think that this brings another level of professionalism to that and you can explain you know barriers three different barriers things like that but you can also explain this as an option and it shows your level of professionalism as a company. And if you get your team certified in it, it also shows another level that you're going deep and everybody kind of understands the seriousness of the matter mm -hmm. and that anybody that's in your backyard from our team or company can walk you through this or can share where we got certified and things like that. So there's another level of giving back to the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, you know, one thing in terms of like marketing from a business standpoint, we always encourage photos. We train groups. We're always like, take some photos. Because when you have a business, let's face it, you have some type of social media. You're not just like, nope, we don't believe in that internet stuff. I mean, how else are people going to find you without the internet, right? So taking some photos during training is always a good opportunity. Because when I look at my social media, I don't use my social media to like attract necessarily new customers. I mean, we have reviews up there. We have photos and things like that. And I always try to post stuff fun and breezy. But it's also a way to engage your customers so they see you, you know, like they get to kind of know you a little and like, oh, look, here's our staff getting their annual training, you know. So it kind of like gives you a little stuff to brag about, too. And it just makes it more of an activity where, you know, people can see you actually getting it done. So we always encourage people to take photos. People like to see that kind of stuff, you know, like they get like to get to know their brands. Yeah, definitely. And that's something that, you know, we just got to keep doing every time one person comes in they should share it on their personal it's like we're trying to get this to catch on so it's like if everybody knows cpr the more the better off 
everybody will be as a whole. Because mm-hmm. um, anything, I mean, we're talking about pools specifically, but having a swimming pool or working around a swimming pool, there's a big, big responsibility that comes attached with that. And everybody that everybody should be um, certified. So maybe you could tell us um, about the company Desert Education Solutions and all the different classes that you offer and the location because you're nearby, right? We are nearby. I could literally walk here if it wasn't for the airport and they don't let me just run around the airport around. You'll get tased. You will get tased running down <laughs> the <that> tarp. <laughs> Be like, a nurse was arrested today at Scottsdale Airport for cutting through. <laughs> Like, I don't want to go all the way on Greenway. Um, um, so right up here in Scottsdale, right off of, um, behind the, the Scottsdale quarter, we're just right in front of the airport. So we got some beautiful views, some gorgeous planes. And then we also have an office in Goodyear to service the west side. So we kind of feel like our Scottsdale office is our north and east valley location. And then we do have our Goodyear location, which is right off of the I-10 in Bullard, um, which is actually sometimes an easier location to get to because we're literally right off the freeway. Um, and we have our two locations to serve you. We teach classes, um, about right now we're about five days a week. We're always looking to increase that with other instructors and we offer classes for the general public. I also go to schools, things like that, and do some demos with the kids because that's always fun. Kids always have a lot of questions about CPR. We work with healthcare providers. So we have our lay rescuer classes, which is part of a, a brand from the AHA called the Heart Savers. And that's designed for absolutely anyone that wants to take it. So they could take the CPR training, which includes how to use an AED. And then we also offer first aid, which may be something of value too, because we go over other medical emergencies like bleeding, environmental, we cover heat stroke, we cover drownings. We also cover allergic reactions. You know, you got a pool got hibiscus because they're tropical you have bee stings so we cover how to you know act for stings and things like that so there's a first aid component and then we also teach for our healthcare providers so we teach something called advanced cardiac life support or acls we teach a pediatric version that our beloved people at phoenix children's take called pediatric advanced life support or pals and then i also teach a class just for uh, newborns called nrp it's needle neonatal resuscitation So we teach everything from kids all the way up through physicians, nurses, respiratory, fire, paramedics, you name it, just about anybody. So we train about 8,000 people a year between our two locations. Perfect. Thank you so So. much. And where can people, uh, do you have a website or something? People can find out more information. We do. You can go to deserteducation.com. We take all of our registrations by uh, our website, as well as we have an email address it's really the best way to reach us although if you do call you'll get my mom she answers <laughs> our phones hello <laughs> yeah she's you'll hear it she'll be like oh this is desert education it's joanne um <laughs> you can hear the shit people always ask like are you from chicago and she's like why do people ask that i'm like i don't know mom <laughs> i have no idea <laughs> so my mom answers our phones we're kind of a mom and pop uh organization like my husband is also a nurse and he teaches with me and then my sister is respiratory and she teaches for us my mom answers the phone um my nephew does website stuff <laughs> so and i pay him to clean uh, <laughs> <laughs> perfect and we are taking precautions for COVID 19 we even put that on our website because you know people are nervous about taking a class we are maintaining social distancing we got every station to have their own mannequins so you don't share any mannequins at all so you stay on your own station and we give out these little bottles of hand sanitizer too that smell like tequila um not good tequila either like yeah I, yeah shop, i know exactly I what you're talking so. about but there's there are three there are three mls they're not very big but you get 40 little sprays that's the trick it does and it's an 80 percent proof i don't even know it's so boozy <laughs> when everyone sprays i'm like okay <laughs> we're all sanitized now so um we've really you know we're wearing masks still just because you know you're you're breathing a lot when you're doing compression so best to just kind of cover up and then we have the like i said we have what's called the blended learning so if you're a little queasy about sitting in a classroom for two hours you can definitely do the blended learning where you just get to watch all the fun videos at home and then you come in and do the hands-on skills and that part takes about 45 minutes or so so it's just all hands-on and that's like i said that's been a very popular option right now yeah it seems like it yeah especially for the first aid because the first aid is a lot of video 
And so they're showing you how to use like an EpiPen and stuff. So that one's kind of good to take at home because. Well, nobody wants to be the dummy in the class too. So it's nice to be educated to a certain degree before actually going to the class. So I'm sure that helps, Mm -hmm. you know, a ton. Yeah. Yeah. Because with the blended learning, you can go back. Or if there's something you know really well, you're like, oh, okay. All right. I got that. And move on. Um, Because some people do. They carry an EpiPen. So they're like, I know this EpiPen section. Like nobody's business. We even cover how to use an inhaler. So, you know, a lot of asthmatics out here, they already know how to work an inhaler. But it's those things that they don't know about. Um, like one of the things we cover is burns and cool cool off the burn. You know, a lot of people want to put, you ever heard of someone putting butter on a burn? Mm-mm. Yeah. Okay. I was, my, my was 70s children. All right. <laughs> but when I was younger, I was always like, oh, she's got a burn. Put a little butter on them. Um, butter is the last thing you want to put on a burn. So we cover burns of all degrees, heat stroke, how to recognize heat exhaustion, heat stroke. And we even cover hypothermia, which is not a problem out here. Yeah. But we do cover it. Heat stroke would be a really good one. Heat stroke is a big one. So recognizing that stuff. And we even have a class just for people who work with kids called Heart Savers Pediatric. So if you just work in a daycare or you're a grade school teacher and you want to know more about first aid geared towards kids, there's even a pediatric version. So they deal with more pediatric type emergencies. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking the time to be on the show. This was a great conversation, and we think uh, this will have a real big impact on a lot of people and companies. And hopefully everybody listening will become CPR certified and reach out if they have any questions about any of this. But thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Hey, Pool Chasers. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. To connect with today's guests, including pictures, links, and resources from everything discussed today, you can visit the episode page at poolchasers.com or click the links below. To connect more with us, you can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter by searching at Pool Chasers. If you would like to support the podcast, the easiest and most effective way is to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, as well as share the show or your favorite episode with a friend or on social media. Also, you can get early access to each episode by supporting us through Patreon. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for sharing some of yours with us today. See you out there, pool chasers.